right. Good day, everyone. Uh, good morning for some of you that still may be before noon. Good afternoon for those of you that are in a different time zone or a different place of the world where it may be a completely different time of day for us all. But I'm glad that we're all here to today together um, for this meeting about soul formation. In some of these prior classes, I have discussed how the science has revealed to us in many different ways that there's this intelligent field that we could call source, we could call divine, we could call God, we could call a number of things. But I wanted to share with you a couple of um, very interesting times when it was without question, it was like God gave us a wink with a couple of uh, clients I've worked with. With a couple of women I've worked with over the last uh, few weeks, um, many times the topic of this divine, this God, this infinite power, this uh, infinite intelligence comes up because it is the real source of where the healing comes from. What my job is to do is just help people get out of the way, help them get out of the way, because the the scars that we inherit through our traumas and our young early life become the um, things that get in the way as adults, the, the little feelings that come up, the emotional surcharge of things, and then the stories that start running on our head at that, why we can't, why we, why we don't deserve it. Um, all these things, why we don't deserve healing, why we're no good. All of these essentially are, are the scars of, of early experiences in, in our childhood life. And one of the things that is very important in this work that I do is just helping people gain back connection to that infinite source. And two of the stories that I want to share with you is um, with women that did not know what God was. And they, of course, had grown up in the traditional church of asking questions and thinking, you know, you know, but whenever I tell them that there's an infinite intelligence out there that wants what's best for us. And I'm a scientist talking about this. They had really good inquiry of questions about, I don't know what God is. And I don't know if I trust God. And I don't know, you know, what, what this, this thing is doing for me. And through some of the work that we've done, some of the deep digging, uh, these two women shared with me in the last few weeks, really incredible things that I wanted to share with you. The first one was this woman had never experienced anything even remotely close to God. Her life has been chaos. She's grown up here in some of the things that we do here in the Western world, but it just didn't apply to her. Like she just did not have any space in her life for this so-called God to work. Right. And I respect that. And I'm, I'm certainly aware of that. And what I'm trying to do is get her in the work to the moment after conception to before the trauma ever happened. There's sometimes there's a millisecond of moment where we have conception to where whenever we have our first taste of humanity, our first taste of experience, and sometimes it's a razor blade. But my work is about getting people to that. When they get that, when we get them to that moment, they have all the proof they need of divine. I don't have to do anything else. And this woman shared with me, she goes, I was driving my car the other day and I told myself, and one of her, one of her biggest things that's been a reoccurring theme in her illnesses, um, that she always feels alone. She always feels alone, always feels alone. And after we got her to that razor blade edge and connected her with that part of herself, she's driving in her car and says this. I'm not alone. And she says, Gabe, I cannot believe it. I, I just cannot believe it. But I felt this warm presence in my car and this hand touch my shoulder, letting me know I wasn't alone at all, letting me know God was there. So this happened in the last few weeks. This is what I want to share with you in soul formation about some of the things I see in clinical practice. But here's a woman who's never had space for God suddenly having this warm hand touch her back. And the change you can see and you can feel and you can see it in her eyes is just incredible. That was one woman. Another woman who felt like she had never uh, trusted um, what she grew up hearing. Uh, there was a lot of 
Um, there was a lot of low self-esteem things that she had learned growing up with the church and her mom and some of their beliefs. So whenever I'm talking about divineness, where the healing comes from, it's God's place to heal you, not mine. Of course, there's you know some barriers. I have to get her back to that razor blade before she ever picked up that perception, that razor blade moment after conception. Once we connect her there, it's it, my work's done. She has all the proof she needs. And this woman said to me, I want to manifest things in my life, Gabe, and I want I want to do that. How can I do that? And I said, you have to have source connection. And she goes, okay, I feel like we've done something with that. But how do I know God's listening to me? How do I know that this field of energy that I'm describing to you, that science has proven is real? She's saying, how do I know that's real? And it just so happens that I told her that some of the journals I've read and some of the stuff I share in my book is that stars are um, their own thinking entities. There's research now showing that stars in our universe are their own thinking entities that move around deliberately. They aren't just these fixated balls of gas that we've been uh, taught growing up. I had this discussion with her about this, right? And sh And I said... Why don't you ask the source for a sign from your heart because you've touched it because we've been there and you and you feel that moment. You feel that something greater than yourself. You felt that. Why don't you ask it for a sign, something you've never done? Maybe you've done some prayers, but you've never felt like they've worked. And she goes, OK, she goes, I'm going to. And I said, ask for a sign that this God that this information, this intelligence is listening to you and ask it to give you a response within the next 24 hours, a sign that it's listening that's so unmistakable that you know without a doubt that it had to come from God, right? She goes, okay. Well, I take my family to uh, Willow Rock um, over the weekend. And when we're leaving Willow Rock, we had a great time as a family. Tiffany shows me a message on her phone that we got from practice better and uh she says oh my god gabe i'm talking with my mom and my mom said isn't it something in job how the stars sing to each other and she says this was completely random this is something my mom has never said before completely out of nowhere but here we are talking about the stars being thinking deliberate entities and then my mom tells me after when i asked for a sign that the stars sing to one another and she knew right then and there it was god winking at her letting her know yes i am listening to you yes i am responding to you so i'm a scientist above all else but i also i also look at the scriptures to look how they make us how they're how they're able to help us live the better life and like i said in the bible it gives us clear directions on how to live the better life through parables and through metaphors and through stories right so i just wanted to share that with you this morning because i thought that was really fascinating i've talked to you many times about this source of energy that science has proven is real that's nature's responsive to us and what we could only call god infinite intelligence divine and these are just a couple of um fascinating stories i've had uh, in the last few weeks that i i want to share with you on 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 great things happening when my patients get back in contact with um the divine when previously it wasn't part of their life so today i would like to discuss with you um the importance of looking after yourself making sure that you are taking time for yourself this is a very important concept because um, many people today have an automatic, um, automatic, uncontrollable, sometimes very gripping urge in themselves to excessively be concerned for the needs of others while completely disregarding their own emotional needs. And, and these people that do this grippingly, unconsciously, excessively concerned for other people's emotional needs while disregarding their own are all at significant risk of developing chronic illness. For instance, one of the illnesses that um, I talk about once in a while, because it's like the doctors that I mentioned, the, the Lyme doctors and everyone else, 
doesn't really understand how ALS operates. And I've never met a natural doctor that really knows how to reverse it. So the thing I want to just give an example of is that, that the personalities of people that have ALS, amylolytropic lateral sclerosis, also known in the Western world as Lou Gehrig's disease, um, these people have exactly the same personality and the same behavior pattern with no exception. Uh, according to the medical school, uh, regarding ALS patients, psychiatric doctors and researchers wrote this, and I quote, these patients, they variably invoke admiration and respect from all staff who came in contact with them. Characteristic was their attempt to avoid asking for help. So they do everything to avoid asking for help. Hard, steady work without recourse to or for help from others was pervasive. That means they have a strict obligation to their duty with, with no asking for help from others. Um, there seemed to be a habitual denial, suppression, or isolation of fear, anxiety, and sadness. This means there was no expression of these negative emotions. They do not, they do not show these emotions in any way, shape, or form in their life. Some spoke gradually and casually, casually of their deterioration, like it didn't matter. And they did so with engaging smiles, end quote. So the thing I want to point out, the reason I begin with this uh, from the literature describing how ALS personalities are, and I've asked many times, I've talked to nurse practitioners that work in hospitals, and I say, have you ever met anyone with MS or ALS? And they say, oh, many times. And I start describing the personality of the people, and they, they, they're they shocked. Their jaw hits the ground because it's without exception. Those are the kind of people that um, – those are the kind of personalities that happens to these people. And after the end of today's soul formation, you'll kind of understand why a little bit more. It's easy for us to get wrapped up in attempting to measuring up to other people's expectations and attending their needs and sort of putting ourselves on the sidelines. Sometimes we can do that. Um, it could be the demands that our job has. Uh, it could be the demands that our clients, our customers, have the need to please them. Uh, it could even be our spouse trying to keep them satisfied. The pressures that come with operating a family, trying to juggle the needs of our kids uh, and then go off to the grocery store at the end of the day, make dinner for everyone, clean the house and be off to the cousin's birthday party, you know, the minute we get a rest. And it's easy to get caught up in all of these things and this cycle of thinking over time that we can't let anyone down, that these people are counting on us, that we're always there. It's really as you get caught up on this. And sometimes we may even have kind of a rescue mentality, a rescue mentality as though we're the one that always comes through. We're the one that always tries to take on the weight of others. We have to be there when problems arise to try and fix everything and show up every time early to try to fix the problem and stay late. Sometimes it can be real easy for us to have this rescue mentality. And the reason I brought this up in the literature is because we need to understand the reason I brought this up, you know, sharing literature with you, medical literature, that is if we are constantly and compulsively doing all these things around us, scrambling in attempts to keep others happy, we will soon deplete our own vitality our own energy will be begin to get drained, just like you heard that happens with people with ALS. And I want to point this out. It's not just ALS, by the way. It's a number of chronic illnesses, autoimmune conditions, um, various types of chronic disease, mystery symptoms that show up, and, of course, cancer with people that have these kind of traits and qualities, okay? Uh, we will ensure that when when we ensure that everyone else is a priority over us, we will always suffer in the end. 
when we ensure that everyone else is a priority over our needs, it's us that suffers in the end. We must learn to take care of our own needs. We need to make ourselves a priority. Your first and most crucial role amongst everything else is to first keep yourself healthy. Keep yourself healthy. Okay? It's not selfish to focus on yourself and to take time for you. This time is of vital importance. This time for you to take on your own is of vital importance to recharge, refresh, and refill your reservoirs. In order for you to be balanced, you need time by yourself. Okay? My wife loves to read. Okay? I go to the gym whenever I'm done at the end of the day with clients. Um, we go out, we jump on the trampoline, we get in our pool, we take time and we get away from our phones and get away from everything and just go out there and have fun as a family. Everyone's different. You may need to go for a walk. You may need to have a good laugh. Sit down and have a good laugh. Uh, time to exercise, time to unwind in whatever way it may be for you. You need some recreation. To be concerned with the emotional needs of others is equivalent to a constant withdrawal of your own vitality and your own vital energy. And to be balanced and negate the risk of developing illness, you need, to, you need to have a time and a place with an equal amount of deposits. So you need a deposit. You can't just keep withdrawing and withdrawing and withdrawing. And if you only withdraw and never deposit, just like you, just like it makes sense, you're going to eventually drain yourself. You're going to eventually end up depleting yourself completely. And that's what happens with these people. That's why they are smiling as they're talking about their disease very casually, like it's no big deal. Okay, they've been conditioned. Do not only be good to others while not being good to yourself. Don't be kind to others with not being kind to yourself and loving to yourself. Do not take on that rescue mentality of, I have to be strong. I have to please everyone. They're counting on me. I got to, I got to be at every event. I got to be there. I can't say no. It'll make me feel guilty. I won't measure up. What will they think of me if I say no? This is constantly the, the, the underlying mentality with these rescue type mindsets. I've learned that people, even close family members, okay, will take as much as you give them. They will take and take and take. They will often let you exhaust yourself, deplete yourself. Sometimes close family members, in fact, would let you work 24 hours a day if you let them. They would let you work 24 hours a day. When you're emotionally depleted, when you're physically drained, and when you're run down, it's not only doing you a huge disservice. It's, al it's also doing your family, your children, the ones closest around you, a disservice as well. So this, this trait of always attempting to please others while negating yourself is a fast track for destroying your health. Mentally, physically, emotionally, when you don't say no to certain things and deep down you want to, you know you should, it instantly raises your blood pressure. It'll instantly raise your blood pressure. It'll instantly increase tension in the body and it will start to create deep stresses and tensions that start getting worse and worse and worse and worse. And over time, uh, these become the very manifestors of chronic illness. We are not blaming people for this, okay? We're not blaming people for these patterns. We're not blaming people for the conditioning. Uh, these are unconscious patterns. And the things that I'm describing are not done deliberate. They're not done deliberate, okay? The roots of these patterns sometimes, and when they're more serious, need to be investigated. And they're always rooted in our earliest childhood experiences. But no one can begin to disrupt this pattern except you. Nobody can disrupt this pattern except you. You have to make a decision. You remember when I talked about decisions? Most people can't make a decision. They're, on, they're kind of on one side or the other. They keep going back and forth and not sure what to do. They make a decision and they talk themselves out of it. I'm going to tell you right now, the most successful people I've ever met on earth, the most successful people 
that I've ever met on planet Earth are ones that know how to make decisions. And when I learned that, I learned how to make decisions. Sometimes you have to sit on it for a little while, but then you make a decision. You let your heart decide. You make the decision. When you make your, when you have a, a, a decision that your heart's telling you, you should shut that brain off because the brain will talk you out of it. Okay. So that's what I'm here to tell you right now. We have to make a decision. Make the decision right now. Say, I'm not going, I, I'm going to make some adjustments to my schedule. Say to yourself, I won't go running to rescue this friend or this family member, my sister, every time she calls and she's, things are gone off again. I'm not, I'm not going to put so much pressure on myself to live up to the demands that are not reasonable. Make that decision today. I'm going to keep myself balanced. I'm going to keep myself healthy. I will always be watching and maintaining a good emotional well-being. Those are the things you should make a decision about right now. Because if you do not make a decision and you don't stick with that decision, please understand I would want you not to count on anything changing. Don't count on anything changing if you can't make a decision. Okay? Ever. Don't count on anyone who depends on your rescue attempts to ever say, you know, you look tired. Why don't you take some time off? Why don't you take some time to rest? Don't count on that sister or that brother-in-law or whoever else it is. Don't count on them to say, why don't you spend this weekend doing whatever you need to do? You know, I'm not going to say it doesn't happen, but most likely it doesn't happen because we've conditioned these people. They're conditioned to expect you to give. They're, con they're expecting you to bend over backwards and give and give and give and give. And what happens when you're doing that? More withdrawals, withdraw, withdraw, more withdrawals, more withdrawals. They may even be rattled if you do make a decision for yourself. They may be rattled. Uh, if you make a decision to rest and recover and find some balance, and they may not like it, they may not like this, but it's your vitality and your emotional well-being that's far more valuable than attempting to keep everyone else happy and satisfied. Okay, One of the most, not even controversial, one of the most common characteristics of chronically ill people, without a doubt, is... I am responsible for how other people feel, and I must not disappoint anyone. And this, this mentality will override any outside interventions the person does to be healthy, whether they're taking supplements, whether they're eating plenty of colors from the rainbow and they're exercising. If they have that kind of mentality, um, the stressors that come on deep inside them will overcompensate and override any of that. I've met many, many people that have malignancy and they have less than a 12% body fat. They wear spandex, they exercise all the time and nobody's figured it out. And that's the first thing I visit with them are those kind of lists of personalities. If you begin to follow your de your decision, if you make a decision now and you feel guilty, don't allow that guilt to push you to do things that keep you out of balance. Okay. There is absolutely nothing to feel guilty about whenever you decide that you're going to bring some balance into your life. You should not feel guilty for taking a moment to rest. If you feel drained, you need to rest. When you feel depleted, you need a deposit. You need some self-care. You need to sit down and read a book. You need to go for a walk. You need to take that time. And I'm not saying to you that you cannot assist others. Or I'm not saying to work hard. I'm not saying to work hard. I am saying that you need to be balanced. You have to, when, with all those withdrawals, you have to make some deposits, period. You cannot be withdrawing on yourself constantly and not have yourself be depleted. You cannot give 100% to your family without rest. You can't be strong for others and act as a rescuer all the time when your own vital energy is drained. Make the decision. Say this, sorry, my plate is full right now. Sorry, I need a break. Sorry, I need a moment for myself. I need to recharge myself. Make the decision this the make the decision right now. Here to do that today. 
when Jesus was on earth, he went around acting as a healer, a teacher, lifting people up, and being a rescuer. Everywhere he went, he was always met by some kind of need. He went here and he went there, and everywhere he would go, people would run up to him and say, can you heal my child? Can you come to our town? Can you do this for us? Can you solve this problem? Can you do this? Can you do that? Can you do this? Can you do that? People would just come out of nowhere and take all these deposits from him. He had all these demands he was met with. Now think about this for a moment, all these demands and how it depleted him. He had this anointing, wisdom, so much to offer, okay? And at times, he needed to rest. He needed to rest. The scripture said he went away from the crowds and into the mountains alone to pray and refresh. He could have felt upset, guilty. So many people, you know, need my help. So many people need my healing. But he still allowed himself the time to refresh and replenish himself. So no matter how anointed you are, no matter how wise you have, no matter what kind of rescue mentality you have, you're still going to get depleted. There will always be necessary times that we need to recharge and rest. And Jesus even knew he had to take care of his temple. He had to take care of his temple. Despite all the needs around you, maybe your family, your children, your spouse, your friends, others that are counting on you, you will need some time alone to redeposit your energy currency. And if Jesus himself had to recharge, if he had to spend time in the garden, the scripture says garden, the wilderness, and the mountainside, by himself and often at the sea, there's no way that we could go all this time nonstop without resting ourselves. On a regular basis, you need to take time to replenish yourself. Life itself can take a tremendous amount of withdrawals from us. And some of these things, we're not even really aware they're happening. We're not even, sometimes we're so conditioned, we don't even know we're withdrawing, okay? Uh, our most dominant thoughts are not the ones we're aware of. With, with, within these dominant thoughts that we're not aware of, we need a detox from things. Everything from traffic to work to deadlines that going on, delays, dealing with difficult people, Negative news, unexpected circumstances, things happen. These all take a deposit on us. These are all ways that drain us. Don't make the mistake of overlooking this and starting to live overdrawn. If you go into a new week, a new week, and you're at a deficit because of all these draining things that you've neglected to pay attention to, and then more draining things begin to show up in your life, more things coming at you, they're taking and taking and taking, and you're already in a deficit. Well, you're going to get to the point when there's soon nothing left to take. And this is when your mind starts to get really overwhelmed, when you start to get frustrated, when you start to become not peaceful, not productive, not present. You start to notice all these things start to happen. It's like everything gets tied in a knot. Everything goes crash. That's when you need to take time to get in balance, okay? You need to have time for yourself to get in balance. And I'm going to share with you a really good mental detox ex exercise on a regular basis. This is a great way to unclutter your mind with this exercise, okay? I call it the God box. You want to take time to mentally detox and let some of these things go. This is a great way to... Um, I wouldn't call it a replenishment, but I would definitely call it a rebalancing exercise, a mental detox that helps get rid of some of this clutter that is picking away at you that's still there, that's still causing deposits to go on even after the event is over, even after the event has occurred, okay? So to do this God box, there's going to be a couple of things that you want to do. You have to be focused and absorbed. You have to be able to pretend and you want to be able to, you want to be able to know that this greater mind is there for you. And I just shared some examples of patients of mine that um, 
basically got a nudge from God, a wink, if you will. They asked for it and they got it because they got out of their own way and they said, okay, God, give me a wink. And they got a wink uh, without mistaking. And these are just some of the most wonderful things that just bring joy to my heart to know that these patients are much closer to God. So what I'm going to tell you is you need to be aware that there is a universal mind out there that's ready to take on this load for you, that's ready to take on these problems when you can surrender those problems to it. Okay, and that's what this exercise is. So for God Box, I want you to imagine that there is a dashboard that kind of surrounds you of information like this. And this dashboard has all kinds of data just floating around in it. So imagine these files, like computer files, you know, red and green and yellows and all kinds of different colors just floating around. And these are representing things that are taken from you. These are the things that are withdrawing, whatever they are. Okay, you don't have to give them specific meaning. This isn't for that, but you just know there's all kinds of things floating around you that are constantly picking at you, constantly there, constantly drawing more energy. So what I want you to imagine is this golden box that's glowing right here in the center, right here in the center. Okay, this beautiful glowing box. And if it helps you to use your imagination, closing your eyes, then feel free to do so. But imagine this golden box right here. And imagine all these files of everything that are taken withdrawals that are constantly there start to move and float and go right into that box. Just see all those files start to move right into that box and you see them stacking themselves, so stacking themselves nice and organized, starting to go into this box. They're all kind of going in there and you see all these files. You don't even know what they are. You just know you're tired of dealing with them. You're ready to hand them off to God. You're ready to give them to a greater mind to handle you don't even have to know what they are, but just see all those pieces floating and moving and going right into this colored box. And now you'll start to notice there's less of them and there's less and all this scattered stuff was here seems to be a little more sparse. Keep just putting all those things in there. And now there's just very few. And now there's just a few and put the rest in there. And if you got to upgrade your box, if you got to make it bigger and you got to make it to a crate, you got to make it to the back of a bulldozer or, or the back of one of those huge mining trucks, feel free to do so. Whatever's going to hold this load of stuff. It's up to your imagination how you do this. But if you got to make a box that is now the size of six mining trucks, feel free to do so. But put all that stuff in there and then picture the top of that box shutting and it's like there's tape going across that pack and tape noise and you see a sharpie writing on the top to god to source to universe and just imagine that container that box just going straight up into the sky moving right up into the clouds you see it going way up there getting into the clouds and you see it start to kind of disappear and you see a lightning strike it and you see this bright light and it disappears and what you'll notice with that is suddenly just there's a lightness. There's suddenly not so much tension, not so much weight there. Um, let those things go. So if you find yourself going right back to whatever is bothering you, some kind of some kind of file there that's taking and withdrawing and withdrawing and withdrawing, simply repeat this process a few more times. OK, I can tell you with all the advanced nuclear work I do on myself, this is still one of my go to's on a regular basis just because life is taxing. Life can be a, a series of withdrawals that are happening all the time. And the problem is after that withdrawal occurrence has been there, there's still something out here floating in space that represents it. So it's still taking up your precious energy. So do that a couple of times and. You might notice suddenly it just kind of lightens up. Well, think of that as kind of a refresher. It's a it's a really good mental detox exercise uh, to do regularly. So make the decision. You're going to watch out for yourself and make the decision. You'll do this every few minutes when you feel yourself clustered, when you feel like you've got too much going on. Take a moment to do this to yourself. Okay. Does anyone have any brief relevant questions? Uh, did everyone, can everyone put a hand icon up or something in the chat, whatever else, did somebody find some kind of use to this today? Okay, excellent.
seeing some thumbs up. Right. So Lauren is asking, uh, or she's, she's saying fasting. My uh, grandfather died of ALS. Sorry to hear that. Um, yeah. Ask your mom about his personality and you'll, you'll, you'll see some traits of that. If he was the nicest person would do everything for everyone else, take his own shirt off his back and never ask for it in return. That's what's very common. Okay. Again, constant withdrawal, 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 withdrawal. Okay. All right. Well, a, everyone, I was so glad to have you here with me today. Thank you for joining me. And I'm looking forward to seeing you all next week. Thank you. Have the best day. You as well, Amy. Bye-bye.